sailed the seven seas, flown the whole blue sky. But I've returned with haste to where my love does lie. No matter where I go, I will come back to my English rose. Discover the secrets of England's best short breaks at enjoyengland.com. Hello, this is Digital Wonderlust, a show from the Retrospect podcast concerned with the varying geographies found in video games. For those who've read my recent blog post on inretrospectpodcast.com, you will be aware of a project that I've had in mind for a while. For the past two and a bit years, I've largely devoted myself to selecting one or two games and looking at their psychogeography in detail. Well, this time, I want to look a bit bigger. An entire country, let's say. How are the geographies of different countries depicted in gaming? Now, one of the reasons I've avoided doing such a special is that in attempting to evaluate the depiction of a country, you inevitably have to tread on eggshells. It's a potential minefield, making sure you don't offend and, as gaming has become increasingly noticed by the rest of society, the politics of level design have become even more treacherous. Therefore, these specials will not seek to establish a correct realisation of a nation, nor will they name and shame games that fall on stereotypes. Rather, I will attempt to be as objective as I possibly can, highlighting my observations and what conclusions can be sketched from these. I've decided not to look at any sports games because in truth they tend to just feature an arena or stadium or racetrack and don't really flesh out the rest of the country per se. In the spirit of objectivity it made sense to kick off this round of specials with my home country, England. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself, against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea. Thank you, William Shakespeare. England. Home of games companies such as Core Design, Criterion Games, Media Molecule, SCE Studio Liverpool, Codemasters, Boss Baddy, Idus Interactive, Ninja Theory and some of Rockstar. The name England is derived from the Old English meaning Land of the Angles, a Germanic tribe which settled during the Middle Ages. Its motto or catchphrase is God and my right and its anthem It's God Save the Queen, and its flag is the St George's Cross, who is also their patron saint. Despite being born here, I've never really viewed myself as an Englishman. George Orwell once said that in left-wing circles, it is always felt that there is something slightly disgraceful in being an Englishman, and that it is a duty to snigger at every English institution, from horse racing to suet puddings. It is a strange fact, but it is unquestionably true, that almost any English intellectual would feel more ashamed of standing to attention during God Save the King than stealing from the poor box. You see, I kind of agree with Orwell, apart from the poor box thing, I don't really steal from them, or any areas at all really. You see, I have no real interest in any of the principal traditions of England. I don't really see myself as a royalist at all, or a member of the Church of England. I don't even know the words to the national anthem. I have no interest in following England in any sporting events. I think my lack of patriotism stems from the fact that I'm wary of its interpretation by some individuals as a means to negate other nationalities. 
i.e. England is great. Yay, England. The reason I'm stating all of this is because in the ensuing episodes, I'm going to be looking at other countries, many of which I have no personal connection to. I'm going to attempt to be just as impartial in this episode on England as with all the others. Although, as well as we all know, this is a challenge. Our landscape shapes us, defines us. Can I distance myself from my Englishness? Whatever that means. If you were to design a level set in England, how would you go about it? What would you include? What would you not include? The following list of games is just a handful of titles that have attempted to depict this country. First up is Andy Cap, a game developed in 1987 for the Commodore 64 by Blitter Animations. It is based on a successful comic strip of the same name, printed in the Daily Mirror and Sunday Mirror newspapers. The player's objective is to keep Andy Cap's alcohol reserves high by acquiring money whilst avoiding punching his wife and beating up police officers. Yep, they don't make games like they used to. Aside from its moral ambiguities, with regard to its depiction of England, we see empty streets flanked by brick buildings, with Cap's walk punctuated by the odd gas lamp. There is a distinctive Victorian quality to its architecture, its age highlighted by the monochromic visuals of the game. England here looks pretty dull, but in part I think that's because of the Commodore 64's gaming architecture, there's only so much you could kind of depict with what you've got. And I kind of quite like the fact that <laughs> daylight and nighttime is denoted by different shades of grey. Moving into the 90s, we have the turn-based strategy game, Lords of the Realm, developed by Impressions Games in 1994 for PC and Amiga. Set in medieval England without a monarch, the player seeks to become king or queen of the nation by maintaining their land and laying siege to the counties of others. England here is a sea of flat green, a bit like a pool table, with the odd cow denoting its dairy products and castles hinting at the historical period. The pictures that pop up randomly throughout the game are very detailed for the time, yet are highly romanticised, with clean-cut castles and churches, thatched cottages and immaculate countryside. It feels more like a Disney depiction of Arthurian myth than something trying to be historically accurate. So here we can kind of see a romantic kind of take on England at this particular period. Next we have Core Design's platformer Tomb Raider 3, which may have been the first game I played that featured an England level. This was actually my favourite level in the game. I don't know why, but I've always liked London levels. As a city, London has a very rich, occult-ridden past of labyrinthine streets to get lost in. And in this game, produced in 1998, the player does just that, scrambling across rooftops during a rainy night, exploring abandoned tube tunnels, battling with the criminal underworld. It is a place of rough concrete and sharp metal rat-filled warehouses, grubby yet beautiful, a playground for grown-ups. Out of all the games discussed so far, this is an England I strangely want to explore further, a place of mystery. And this isn't the last time that the Tomb Raider series went to London, as you can we picked up later in Tomb Raider Legend, and that actually strikes up the Arthurian myth, so again we get this kind of fascination with the myths and legends of England kind of permeating through its capital.
Moving into the 2000s, we have a spectacularly bland title, developed by House of Tales in 2001. The Mystery of the Druids. In it, the player has to solve a baffling series of murders, uncovering a mystery that originally led to the demise of the British Order of Druids. The England in this game embodies the mystery of Tomb Raider 3 with the clean-cut film set quality of Lords of the Realm. In the same way in which clever Hollywood set dressing can transport landscapes elsewhere, the England in Mysteries of the Druids feels pretend, the blue bobby uniforms of the police looking like costumes. It is interesting though that like Lords of the Realm we have a return to the mythic and romanticised past. This is the country after all that gave us Middle Earth, Narnia, Discworld and his dark materials. Moving from past to present, we find ourselves at The Getaway, an open world driving game set in London. Developed by Team Soho for the PlayStation 2, The Getaway draws from the popular British gang films Get Carter and Snatch, in which players drive through London on missions. It strives to emulate the aforementioned films, but the London it depicts comes across as being far too expansive because of the slow rendering of levels, because you're driving along and the levels are really, like the edges of the levels are really close. So you kind of just get this classic kind of fog, which is like a common tactic in level design. Um, usually to kind of bypass that, you put a twist in the level. So you, it's hidden behind a corner set. But because they were trying to kind of realistically depict London as much as possible, when you get to these kind of long sweeping streets, there's nowhere to hide really. So it, it kind of feels as if like you're playing in a city that's kind of been elevated in the heavens, I suppose, which is kind of odd. So that all that kind of wonderful claustrophobia and alleyways and nooks and crannies of two made of three is kind of lost here because they're trying to be accurate. And because they're trying to be accurate, they're putting all their, all the hardwares, all the effort and energy of the hardware goes into the kind of making it uh, geographically accurate. There's very little effort gone into the actual details, the cars and the people on the street, so it's almost like the opening to 28 days later in that regard. However, despite these clean-cut visuals, there is a sense of familiarity about the location, the odd landmark and English iconography, feeling less touristic, believe it or not, and more realistic. Because there is a tendency when you're depicting and placing a game in England, or particularly London, a capital city, to kind of nod to these landmarks to kind of please the tourists. So I'm thinking Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace, and nowadays I suppose the London Eye. So moving from the city to the countryside, we next visit the English town of Glastonbury in Broken Sword, The Sleeping Dragon, an adventure game developed by Revolution Software in 2003. In the creation of the game, the developers wanted believable but not realistic visuals, and they succeeded in that regard. They were very much influenced by Japanese anime. So you've got this kind of strange kind of westernization of that, which kind of, I think, works, because they're, trying, they're not trying to be something they're not. They're very honest and upfront with the visuals. And this is a Glastonbury I don't really recognize, really. It has r lush rolling green hills, it has the odd windmill and a tower, and it's immaculately maintained, it seems. It's, it's almost like how Hob Hobbiton's depicted in the Lord of the Rings films. It has quaint buildings, and like Andy Cap, its streets have gas lamps. This is a very strong, prominent image in a uh, game set in London, this need to have gas lamps on the streets immediately. That locates it in England, it seems. It also, in this sense, plays off the hippie-ish vibe of the southwest of England, which is a place I've lived in for over four years, with places such as the Cosmic Fairy, which is a shop where you can buy crystals and such. Like the getaway, it has some certain familiar details that denote it being English. So we have a pub with picnic benches outside, hanging baskets. But it kind of clashes with this fantastical and the stereotypical. There's a sequence where you come across a, man, a gentleman um, walking up and down the street and he's he's clearly meant to be upper class he's in um, tweeds he's got a big bushly moustache and breeches and acts in a very brisk kind of manner very stereotypical depiction of the English upper classes a pleasant place at first but after a while 
it gets a bit creepy because again, like the getaway, the streets are very empty. Sticking with the fantastical, we next have Professor Layton and the Last Spectre, part of a series of games produced by Level 5 for the Nintendo DS. Set in the mythical village of Mr. Hallery, the player has to solve the mystery of a ghost that is attacking the occupants at night. Now this is classic creepy English village horror, the kind of place that appears out of the mist one night once a year. But it's complete with dense fog, quaint houses and cobbled streets. Despite this kind of highly elaborate romanticised stereotypical view, I quite like its look and feel. It's kind of almost like a theme park in England depicting it as a maze of architectures that shouldn't but do make sense. Time periods rub up against each other and the unknown lingers around every corner. Finally, in the same year as Professor Layton, we also have Naughty Dog's Uncharted 3, which, like Tomb Raider 3, makes a quick trip to London. Again, like Tomb Raider, London here is a city of layers. The lower you go, the further back into history. On one level, it is probably the most realistic depiction of London in this list. Careful not to tread too much into touristic icons and stereotypes. Tower Bridge is glimpsed in the distance, a black cab is only seen as a blur, same as a gas lamp. There's just enough to please the tourists, but not to annoy the locals. This London is dark, mysterious and caked with history, grimy with sewers and rubbish left in the streets. This is a believable city, but just enough, there's just enough realism in there to make you realise actually it's London and it's polished enough to make you feel that it's also a hyper-real depiction of London. You don't quite accept it as being real, even though it goes to great lengths to kind of ground it in some sense of reality. And I think it just goes to show how far video games have come in this regard. We kind of shift away from stereotypes and very empty and very sparse design to the kind of the bare essentials of what ticks the boxes of being a stereotypical England to something that can be a bit more sophisticated and perhaps a little bit more subtle and nuanced in its depiction of place. Um, that's not generally a rule of thumb. You will find the odd game, even nowadays, that tries to kind of capture this kind of romantic and stereotypical view of England. So what picture of England is painted in this small selection of games then? So on the surface, England has this grime and it has these touristic landmarks. We've kind of got our Big Bens, our Houses of Parliament, our Buckingham Palace, our phone box, our black cabs, our pubs. Whilst underneath all of this, we have the occult and criminal underworld. So thinking of Tomb Raider 3, Uncharted 3 is a good example as well of that. History creates myths and legends, leading to a proliferation of titles concerned with the medieval period, Arthurian myth, the Knights Templar and paganism. There are a number of games I didn't look at which are focused or have some of their levels set in England, which really like to dabble with superstition, the occult. And I think this comes from this Victorian fascination with ghost stories and, and the occult of seances and, and mystery. And kind of many uh, games companies have tapped into that. But what I think interests designers, though, is this consolidation of histories laid on top of one another. So think about it. In England, it is possible to find architectures from different centuries, all on one street. It's like taking a history book and propping it up with all the pages open at once. You kind of get that snapshot as you walk through it or flick through it, as it were. Designers, it seems, have sought to play with this anachronistic architecture emphasising certain elements, such as your gas lamps, your cobbled streets and thatched cottages, 
slipping them amongst the present-day generic designs, such as that we see in the getaway, for example. As a kid playing levels set in England, I think I enjoyed it because I started to feel a bit like a tourist, to understand the fascination others have with the geography of this country. Like, for example, I used to be an activities manager at a summer school, and part of my job was to take huge groups of children from abroad on trips to London. And I'll never forget, like, I'd be in a coach and it'd be full of kids from countries from all over, all over the world, basically. And it was their first time in England. And I'll never forget that, like, turning up in the bus and you get that first glimpse of the Houses of Parliament, the screams and cheers and the flashes of cameras from these people. It was such a big thing for them. And I'd become quite numb to that. I'd never really see much novelty. It was just, you know, there's Big Ben, yay. And But playing a video game, which kind of clearly wasn't trying to depict a realistic London, it was something that was hyper-real, it made me kind of discover something new in it, I suppose, despite whether it's fact or fiction. England became something alien to me. I kind of viewed it as something mysterious. And it, I think that's a, it's something I like, is this sense of mystery. I think that underpins my fascination with, with good levels in gaming, is having that sense of mystery. And I've, I've said this before, but you can equate a good level to a good book. And for me, a good book has that sense of mystery that keeps you guessing to the end. A good game should have that as well. And to get into that, you may have to have that element of the exotic as a point of entry. So maybe we have to play up the kind of con- the unconventional, stereotypical sides of England to kind of create a point of entry for players to kind of want to explore it further, to kind of salt the mine or uh, just tell a little white lie to get people interested and get people in. I mean, t- our tourist information does it all the time by embellishing certain truths. And, and as I do more and more of these shows, as I look at more and more countries, I think what I'll begin to realise that actually I'm not looking at a depiction of a country, but really the idea of a country. there you have it that's the first in our special more of these to come um if you have any thoughts about which country you are interested in looking at next feel free to let us know uh you can find us on twitter at in retweetspect or if you want to let me know personally you can follow me at digital strider if you're not a twitterer and why should you be you're perfectly within your rights not to be you can catch us also on facebook if you're not even a Facebooker, you can find us on our website in retrospectpodcast.com. We've got a great uh, comments box, which you can just quickly and easily let us know your feedback. i tell you what you could do, though, for us, which would be even better. And I'd really, really appreciate it. It'd be absolutely grand if you could do this. Is if you head over to iTunes, uh, the link can be found on our site. Otherwise, just search in retrospect podcast on iTunes. And just give us a little cheeky rating. It won't take you long. Just give us a little cheeky rating. Just so you can let the others know on the World Wide Web where to find the best in gaming critique content. But anyways, until next month, I will bid you adieu. And I will leave you in the capable hands next week of my colleague Sam Turner for another episode of Through the Reticule. But guess what's happening next month? Uh, If you've not read my blog, you won't know about this. But next month is our special. Yes, it's been a long time coming, but next month will be our special. Um, For those who've not listened to our specials, you can find them again on the website in retrospectpodcast.com. They're really my highlight of the year. They've been really phenomenally popular and successful. Uh, We still keep getting massive hits on them. Uh, In our first special, we looked at Metal Gear Solid, the back catalogue of Metal Gear, We then looked at the fascination with Tomb Raider. And last year, we looked at the entire gaming company, Rockstar Games, looking at the controversies, the highs, the lows of that mysterious and enigmatic company. And next month, I promise you, is our biggest one yet. So look for that in retrospectpodcast.com. Anyways, I won't keep you. Thank you very much for listening. And I will see you next month for our special. Bye.